Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. We have an exciting, exciting podcast for you. T- today's podcast is a, a rebuttal. It is a further clarifying of a former podcast that we did. Our guest today, very exciting, uh, Stephanie Kelton and Rowan Gray. They are uh, some of the leading authorities on what's called modern monetary theory, which is kind of a new approach uh, to economics. First, thank you for uh, inviting both of us to come and talk to you I'm about delighted. this. I'm delighted. All right, so let, let, let me roll it back then, and, and we'll start a little bit at uh, my interest in this. I did an interview with a, a gentleman named Thomas Honig, who uh, I guess was chairman of the KC Fed, and uh, he, he had been voting no on quantitative easing from the Fed, which is their policy of of, of pumping a good deal of money in, into the economy. And he and I had a spirited discussion where I, uh, without the knowledge of economics or the language of economics or the verbiage of economics, was trying to understand uh, why the Fed can just bring this money cannon uh, to corporate America and not also maybe let, uh, as we say in the old neighborhood, Let the people have a taste. Have a little taste. A little something from the money cannon. I guess I'm confused as if we can print money. You just said we're the only... We can buy an asset. Okay. Any asset by printing money. That is... we. But you can't pay debt by printing money. You can buy debt by printing money. So what if we just buy back our debt? Well, because... (laughs) All you're doing is I feel like I feel like I'm, you're having trouble. It's like talking to a monkey. No, you're no. like talking to a monkey no, and trying no, to no, figure no. I, out look, how do I communicate with this monkey? No, no, I don't no. know what to do. No, no. It I totally I totally get it's confusing. Stephanie and Rowan were lovely enough to uh comment on it on the internet in in a long chat form, which made me think that neither of you has a fulfilling life because this is the part. Now we get to it. How did this, how did any of this come to your attention and, and uh, explain to me how this came about? So I, you know, I listen to the podcast and, yes. and I'm Steph- on Twitter. Yes. Rowan's on Twitter. Okay. And there was quite a bit of chatter about this. You, you guys pushed some buttons, but you didn't push the buttons that were pushed for me. And I think for Rowan, we were on the wrong buttons. No, no, no. I think that a lot of uh, the interest in some of the commentary was surrounding, you know, the impact, potential impact of the Fed's quantitative easing program on inequality. But I wanted to take up a different part of the conversation. And I listened to the whole podcast and then I felt very sad. And that's that's our goal. (laughs) Anytime you can listen to the whole podcast and feel sad, I've done my job. (laughs) Misery loves company. So I reached out to Rowan and I said, I feel very sad and I would like you to experience the sadness with me. Would you listen to it together? I'm going to give you guys a chance to unsadden yourselves by telling me what what I was getting wrong there and and where you thought the conversation should have gone. What was it that that saddened you both as you were listening to me talk about uh, Fed policy with, with Thomas Honig? Well, I, I don't think it was so much listening to you. It was the missed opportunity of what you could have potentially pulled out of him had he given you, I think, you know, more candid answers, frankly, to shake, the questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the starting point is that um, we often think of the Fed as the sort of only institution in the federal government that has any monetary firepower, right? It's the sort of printing press. It's the one that can do anything in a crisis. But the reality is, and I think COVID has done a great job of demonstrating this, that it's the fiscal firepower. It's the budget side of things that really has the power Mm -hmm. to um, actually save, you know, real people's incomes, save industries to invest. And one of the big questions is, if we accept that we can do things with the budget and we should be, what is the role of the Fed and how do they relate to each other? And when it comes to things like protecting financial markets from having a liquidity crisis or regulating financial institutions. Yeah, it makes sense. The Federal Reserve might be the place you look to. But when you look at what the Fed is doing, we say the sort of Fed injected trillions of dollars into the economy. One of the things that it's doing is buying up assets. So the first thing to think about is there's always two assets involved. There's the sort of money that goes in and there's whatever's coming back out going to the Fed. So if somebody said to me, hey, 
you've got trillions of dollars, but all you can do is buy other dollars. That's going to be very useless to me if I'm trying to protect homeowners or, That's or people who've lost their incomes. So then the question I think we have to ask ourselves when we look at what the Fed does with quantitative easing is, what is it buying up? And this is where I think you started to get on something really interesting. Let, let me maybe formulate it this way. There's a certain orthodoxy to how we have to get out of it, right? right. A slow raising of interest rates, a tightening of monetary policy. Maybe they burn off some of the money Sh is should there be a a rethinking of that orthodoxy a and the reason why i ask it is you talked about this debt right right to me and clearly i'm a layman and don't understand the intricacies of it it feels made up that this monetary policy feels like a delusion of some sort and why couldn't they just cancel that debt and have the country carry less and then tighten the policy where it would be let if you raise interest rates and the on big debt right, right then we've got all this pressure on making those payments and why not have the fed cancel the debt and then raise interest rates to reset the playing field well, the, the difficulty with that is, of mm -hmm. course, uh, this is debt owed by the government. Mm -hmm. And so now you're going to have, you have this debt um, and you're just going to say, I don't, I don't owe it anymore. And where Tom Honig did not meet you where you were at, you know, he sort of said, oh, it's, it's very complicated, you silly little boy, you know, but I think the reality is you are identifying a real question, which is if the Fed can swap treasury debt, for money, and it basically has very little effect. And it can print money. The Treasury is printing the Treasury debt, and the Fed is printing the money to buy up the Treasury's printed Correct. debt. It's, it's like mom issues an IOU, and then dad takes it out and then gives you cash from your wallet. What's the actual thing going on there? What's the effect on the economy? And Tom says, well, if you understand it like I do, because I'm a very serious economist, mm -hmm. remember, then all you're doing is swapping one kind of government IOU for another. Money is an IOU. Treasury debt is an IOU. Therefore, all we're doing is swapping yellow for green. It's exactly the same. And on one level, he's not wrong. He's not 100% okay. wrong. But on the other side, you are not wrong either which is, is there a difference between treasury debt and money? Yes. Is that difference quite small at an economic level, the way that Tom was saying? Yes. But is it big at a social level, at a political level? As you were saying, absolutely. So if we have trillions of dollars of government debt out there, people hold that as money. You ask Goldman Sachs what's in their cash account, they'll think you're talking about treasury okay. debt. Because for them, treasury debt is money. So if you're swapping treasury debt for dollars, it's like taking money from your savings account and putting it in your checking account. Do you have less money? No. But from a political point of view, from a cultural point of view, you've solved the national debt. We've that, solved our grandchildren's crisis. That, that was the point We've I was trying to make. From China. So I was trying to ask him, who holds our debt? He said, well, China holds our debt, all these other. You can't just stop paying on the debt. No, but you, you could just, couldn't you just quantitative ease our debt. What's the difference of making that money available to Goldman Sachs as it is to making that money available to China? Only one would lessen our debt. You just print that money and pay debt. If this is money that we've created out of thin air anyway, what's to stop us from creating 10, tr you know, I, I used to make fun of Paul Krugman for his idea of a trillion dollar coin, yeah, you know, right. and yeah. now, I feel, I feel myself saying, hey, it. man, well, let's just get $10 trillion coins, right. give one to China, one to Europe. Are we square? Good. And then we start again because this whole thing seems manufactured. Swap it for them for the debt. And then at the very least, we now control, we've bought back our mortgage. So now we can never foreclose on it. Even if interest rates go up, we have a lot more control over our debt. Does that make sense? I mean, I think, I think one of the most important things you were trying to get at with right. him 
was the idea that the, this thing we call the national debt, and this is Rowan's point, we have yellow paper and green paper. We have dollars and we have treasuries, but they're thought of very differently. We don't think of the green paper as debt conventionally, but we think of the yellow paper, the government bonds, treasuries as debt. And that's what the Fed is buying. They're buying treasuries, they're buying bonds. They're buying debt. Yeah, in Tom's mind, they're the same because he thinks up at that central bank level. So for him, they're just different liabilities on a balance sheet. But down with us, in the, you know, with the public, these are entirely different worlds. Do you know the stock of public money in circulation, John? I, I, how many people know that? There's the national debt counter. Right. There's no national money counter underneath. Nobody's counting and, and that. And they're increasing that supply by $120 billion a month still. Yeah, no grandchildren involved. No China involved, that, that's, no bond markets involved. It reminds me of the way our government says, you need to pay for. So anytime we have a crisis or something crucial that the public needs, the government will say, I'm sorry, we have discretionary spending, it's this amount. If you wanna to add to that, we either have to take it away from somebody else or create a pay for. Okay, well, also we wanna to go to war. Oh, okay, so what's our pay for? Yeah, that we're not gonna have a pay for. What do you mean? Yeah, we're just- Freedom pays for that, itself. That yeah. we're just gonna put out there and we're gonna pay for it, but we're not going to, that's gonna be just debt that we don't even think about. We don't add it to anything, it's just is. And that's the part that seems like, well, you just get to decide then what goes on our budget and what's just air. That's the part that I was trying to figure out. That's the politics. And you're exactly right. And the way that I usually try to say it is, you know, there's all this conversation about finding the money. We want to have health care, child care, or we want to have a build back better agenda and all the rest of it. Say, how are you going to pay for it? Where will you find the money? And I always try to say, look, if the votes are there, the money is there because the votes are what kick the money out. So just as you said, every time the Defense Authorization Act comes up every year, they kick the money out. There's no hand wringing. Mm -hmm. They don't pause to have a big debate or discussion. Manchin doesn't stand up and say, wait a minute, I'm concerned about no grandchildren. No pay for, no nothing. Almost all United States senators, it's the most bipartisan thing they do, is vote for the defense authorization each year. And not only that, they say, you know, how much did the Pentagon request? Oh, we feel extra generous today. We want you to have $20 billion they more They gave them another $20 billion. Meanwhile, Always. we're trying to get veterans health care from exposure to burn pits. You cannot believe the shit they're putting these guys through for pay fors for other. They're going to cheap them on the on the back end. It's as though that's not part of the cost of war. It's it's crazy. Yeah. And and I'm just talking about the Fed. And maybe it's not their purview or anybody else. But why can't they do 120 billion dollars of municipal bonds for infrastructure? If you're just buying bonds and debt and treasuries. Why not buy infrastructure? Why not use that money rather than just to keep banks hoarding cash? Why not put it to use? Many years ago, I went to Washington, D.C. at the request of Republican Congressman Ray LaHood, who went on to become sure. Transportation Secretary, right, Illinois. Yep. And LaHood wanted to do exactly what you just said. I mean, the man really wanted to invest in America's crumbling infrastructure, make these investments. And he said, we ought to use the Fed. The Fed ought to be buying these bonds at zero, effectively zero interest rate and facilitating the financing and so forth. And, and a colleague of mine, Randy Ray and I, we wrote something about this. And then I was asked to go to D.C. and meet with officials at the Fed mm -hmm. and walk them through and talk about how this would all work. And so I went. I got to sit in Alan Greenspan's chair. We had a lovely chat. But at the end of the day, they said to me, uh, we prefer to see it go through Congress. And I said, but it's kind of being six of one, half a dozen of the other in these ways that I showed them through the balance sheet entries and so forth. And they said, well, we prefer the half a dozen to the six because one keeps us out of it and the other one integrates us into this process. It explicitly says the Fed is now financing other kinds of things and they don't want any part of it. Yeah, there's a big commitment at the Fed to not be seen as picking winners or losers, which is why in COVID, when they did for the first time establish this municipal lending facility, they hated it. It was barely used. They made it so difficult that only one or two states and municipalities actually took advantage of it. Um, to go to your early question, I think there is a little bit of a difference between government, federal treasury mm -hmm. debt and state and local debt in the sense that the federal government's debt is 
guaranteed by the same full faith and credit as the US dollar. So it really is almost the difference between a large denomination bill right. and a small denomination bill. With these others, you're sort of you're sort of picking up the tab for state and local well, governments, which is a good thing. But is the other side of it too, though, that state and local governments can't run a deficit in the way that the federal government can. Exactly. So if the Fed were going to do that, it would actually be more impactful and it would allow it because so much of the federal spending is really to cover holes that exist within Absolutely. state and local municipal funding. If you asked uh, federal Congress, uh, members of Congress, whether or not New York City should run its own defense force, I mean, putting aside the size of your NYPD, mm -hmm. they'd say, no, that's a federal job. It's too important to be left to local National governments. National security, for God's sakes. Well, then why not for infrastructure? Why not for education? When the answer Healthcare. to why there's, some, yeah, why there's something unique about the federal government, it has the power of the purse. Right. It has that printing press. We're all using that system, right? It's their world. We just live in it. So here's where we get into where I thought, uh, th th this is sort of the difference and, and a very basic understanding I have of supply side economics and demand side economics. And, and I'll explain it as best I can uh, uh, without knowing what I'm talking about, which is how I do things. <laughs> All right. We've had uh, supply side economics for, I don't know, 40 years. And in the last probably 15 years, really hyped up with the Fed pumping a tremendous amount of liquidity into it, keeping interest rates down. It's basically just inflating larger assets at the high level. You're, you're saying to people, saving your money means nothing. But investing it in the stock market or in real estate is everything. If you keep interest rates low and people can't get 4%, 5%, 6% on savings, their only choice is the stock market or real estate or something else. And generally, money is flowing in there and inflating it. The dividends and the buybacks and all those other things that are occurring are creating more and more inequality. Now, supply side economics would say, and that's going to trickle down and create economic growth and development, right? $1.9 trillion tax cut, 0% interest rates, total deregulation. And what did we gain in GDP or median income? Very little. And inflation doesn't do anything. So basically all that supply side money doesn't seem to stimulate the economy in any way. Now, the pandemic occurs and we go, just fucking give everybody 600 bucks. The economy goes 10%, 12% growth. Suddenly inflation's a problem. It makes you think we could have been growing the economy with far less artillery and keeping an eye. It's only when workers get money that inflation becomes a problem. Explain to me in economic terms what I just said and then grade me and then just tell me if I'm going into uh, uh, the next year's class. All right. So you're, what you're talking about are the two different policy levers. The fiscal policy lever is what you described, giving people money, using Congress to pass legislation, what we just right. did. The thing you started with is monetary policy. Correct. It's the central bank. It's the buying of assets. It's the zero interest rate policy and all the rest. And the deregulation and the tax cuts, that's all very Thatcher, Reagan, supply side trickle down. So you're quite right. We have done this. We have run this experiment over and over again for some 40 years or so. The evidence is in, and not just here in the U.S., but around the world. It does not work. It does work. I think if you, some might say as it's designed to work, which is to widen income and wealth inequality. Right. But what it also does by shoveling all of the gains to the people at the very top, who, by the way, don't tend to turn around and spend that money back into the economy, it gives us a slower growing, just crappier economy where fewer and fewer people get ahead. Wage pressure isn't there because the labor market never runs really hot because the economy never really runs close to its, you know, uh, kind of potential. Mm -hmm. And so we have relied on central banks to basically steer the economic ship. You guys figure it out. You use your interest rates and your, um, what did you call it? Rumpelstiltskin skills. Your alchemy. And you take care yeah. of it. Yeah, your alchemy. And fiscal policy, we're just going to worry about trying to keep deficits down and, and all of that sort of stuff. So it is in large part, the 
the reluctance to use that fiscal policy lever and to leave all of the responsibility to the central bank to try to engineer some kind of economic growth. And what do they have? They have an interest rate tool. That's the primary tool. So they do what they can, which is lower and lower interest rate, which if it works, John, monetary policy works by driving people into debt because the purpose of cutting interest rates right. is to induce the rest right. of us to borrow and spend. Whereas fiscal policy works by driving income into people. Like you said, 600 Demand. bucks, here you go. You, it's, you own it free and clear and you don't have to pay it back. So they work very differently. They serve different constituencies. But Stephanie, the, the, the economy, they say 70% of the American economy is consumer spending. Why would you stimulate it at the 15% of the economy when 70% of it is driven by spending? You could stimulate that with such a smaller gun. When you were talking about low interest rates causing inequality, and you mentioned savers and people needing a place to put their to put their you know retirement money, and I think this is a really important point because when you and I think of high interest rates, it's a sort of double-edged sword, right? On one hand, our savings account is maybe earning more or things like that, but on the other side, our mortgage is higher or our credit card interest rate is higher or something like that. And so there are ways around the world, you know, I'm from Australia, there are ways where you can create public pension systems, public savings for consumers. But what we have right now is a system where if you want to pay a higher rate for, you know, mom and pop savers, retirees, those kinds of things, you also have to pay a higher interest rate on all of the hedge funds, all of the other investment funds that hold treasury debt. And so you have this hostage situation where low rates are seen to be the cause of A, inequality, and B, starving savers and pensioners from their money. Whereas the reality is we should have high rates for them, but maybe zero rates on all those investment vehicles. And, that there's, and there's no stipulation. So no, there's no, there's no distinction right. between the two. It's not pension bonds and non-pension bonds. It's just bonds, and a lot of them are held by and, investors who are not and I'll give you an example. The, the, this easy money policy is what allowed the American airline industry to become flush with cash. And so during the time, this is after 2008, they become flush with cash. They do a ton of stock buybacks just to uh, uh, you know, kind of re-enrich their shareholders. And then the pandemic hits and they don't have the cash on hand. So we've subsidized their golden parachutes, but not the industry that we rely on for transportation. So I think the really difficult like line to try to draw is not to say we should just throw interest rates super high because that can put people out of out of you know into bankruptcy from debt and things but we do want to not have that easy money that you're talking about so how can we put tighter financial conditions more restrictions on wall street more restrictions on these big companies so if the idea is we can print money when we need it but the only time we ever use that is when the financial system or the big banks need it it's the only time we'll really print it is for them. In this pandemic, we did it uh, on a more Keynesian level and suddenly inflation ran amok. Again, putting labor over a barrel, which is to say, see, we tried, we gave you guys a little money and look what happened. It doesn't take into account the externalities of supply chain problems in a pandemic. It doesn't take into account that we never got ahead of, we never planned for that influx of money. So it kind of had nowhere to go other than consumer spending. So how do you battle the, the perception at least that when you do have a like more Keynesian approach, it immediately destroys uh, you know, commodities like gas, groceries and everything else that, that the people who are struggling rely on in the first place. So one thing is you look around the world and you see countries that did far less than the United States. We, we had a tremendous response in terms of fiscal policy, right, to deal with the, the pandemic and the economic fallout. About $5 trillion from March of 2020 to March of 2021 was committed through Congress. So you see all these countries that didn't go anywhere close to where we've gone. Germany, 
has inflation running at a 40-year high. China has inflation running oh. at a near 40-year okay. high. So, in, and, and these are the things that you're talking about, energy prices, supply chain, bottlenecks, the, uh, you know, problems related to the shutting down and reopening of different parts of the economy at different times. Yeah. These are kind of the inevitable growth pains. So the correlation is not to- causation in this case. That's exactly okay. right. But you're you're right to say, you know, that there's a real risk that Keynesian economic policy and that the policy response this time, which was so much better than the policy response after 2008, mm-hmm. will come away with a real black eye if people don't get a, a better understanding of why the inflation is up at the moment. If, it, if we start pointing our fingers and saying, well, this is what happens when you try to help people stay in their homes and be attached to their employers and have some income to pay the bills, can't do that ever again. This was the punishment. Can't let that happen. If, if you think about um, the, the where the inflation is showing up, you know, one of the things to look at is where are the real resources there otherwise potentially being deployed? So if somebody comes to a, a bank and says, I want to build a school, that's going to need laborers, it's going to need bricks, it's going to need other things. Say there's somebody else in the next booth at the bank and says, I want to build a casino. It's the same labor, it's the same bricks, it's the same electrical engineers, etc. Now, we don't have a mechanism today to work out where we should put the blame between a private loan, private credit, and public spending. We say, oh, look, we spent a lot of money on school building and now there's inflation in construction. It must be the schools. Meanwhile, all those casinos being built next door get off scot-free because that's not taking place on the government's balance sheet. So when we look at demand, we need to look at all the sources of demand, not just the public's balance sheet. Otherwise, we're always inevitably going to blame the one thing that we changed this time. And of course, no one's saying we need to cut military spending by a third, right? That's not the part of the budget they're going to blame at the end of this. They're going to blame helping average people. If it's that we have the resources, but right now private actors are hoarding them or using them in private markets and they're not available for public use, we need to make them available. You know, it, it always strikes me that uh, when you talk about that that policy, it's okay for the government to intervene. You know, you said earlier about winners and losers. It's always okay for the government to intervene on corporate behalf. For instance, you know, Walmart is, is allowed to, or, or a lot of those companies can pay less than subsistence wages but the American taxpayer subsidizes that with social services. And, and food stamps is basically a subsidy program for craft. You know, it's, it's government money. So we always make money available for corporate America. And it, it makes me come around to this idea of, you know, a universal basic income that is maybe smaller than what we thought about, you know, in, in other ways. But we are subsidizing corporate malfeasance. Like that's where a lot of our money goes. So when you talk about uh, our debt or even, you know, the deficit that's running every year, a lot of that is based on underemployment, undereducation, and there being no constraints. You know what it is? We always talk about, we live in a free market system, but nothing about this system seems free market to me. It seems to be intervened on at all different angles It's only that if you intervene on behalf of workers, is that called socialism? Everything else, that's just, you know, it's crony capitalism, but it's never called that. You know, we're going to subsidize in some respect. The federal government is going to try to find ways to deal with the inevitable problems of poverty. The collateral damage um, of capitalism. Right. But whether it comes in the form of food stamps or some other form of income payment, I don't think that's fundamentally challenging and getting at the issues of a Walmart, being able to continue to underpay workers the way you do that, I think, is to create an alternative workplace so that if you had something like, let's say, a federal job guarantee and everybody had a right to a job Mm -hmm. at a good wage with decent benefits and the rest, that's the way you apply the pressure to the Walmarts and the other, you know, Amazons and so forth in the world to make structural changes. Doesn't Costco basically do the same thing as Walmart? Walmart, they just pay better. It's kind of the same yeah, business. And, and this this goes to your question. You know, I we, I think Stephanie and I both believe that you know people who are the low income should have more money as a you know unequivocal point. But in my opinion, when you think of the future of, of a universal basic income, it's sort of that old line. People say it's easier to remember uh, to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So imagine you've got an Amazon gift card forever. 
that's a UBI in a sense, because you've got your money, you can buy everything you want, and it all goes through the Jeff Bezos machine. It all goes through the Walmart machine. Right. Now, if you go back to the beginning of COVID, there was a point, remember the hand sanitizer shortage? It seems so long ago now. I started that, by the way. That was me. That was... That, that, was, was, you just, that uh, was my hoarding of, of hand sanitizer that caused a lot of that. You and Donald Trump, right? That's <laughs> but, correct. Uh, they, they, there, was a, there was a serious conversation at that point about whether or not we could repurpose perfume factories because the, the underlying chemicals and process was largely similar. Now, right. in that moment, is that socialism to take over Christian Dior and, and, and Chanel to help people not die? Or is that just a national defense of our lives policy? And... Whether or not we're willing to do that, I think, is a really big question. And if we can envisage a production side alternative to these companies, mm -hmm. not just a demand side. We want more money in people's pockets, but we want them to be producing. So what's what's the argument uh, against that? Is the argument against that that, A, the government will naturally not be efficient enough and shouldn't yeah. own... Have you seen the post office? That's the and, and also that it will hold such a competitive advantage against... Uh, other companies. But is there another way where you can hold companies? Look, they get the benefit of our stability and our infrastructure, but none of the responsibility or accountability. They can hold all their money offshore. They can uh, comparison shop for the lowest uh, interest rates around the world to, to hold their debt. They can take their workers as long as they're not a service economy. They can take their workers and shuffle them off to a place where the standard of living is much lower. They've got every advantage and none of the responsibilities and accountability. And so is there another way that isn't coming up with a competitor for them? Is it just holding them to account? I think you can do both. Mm -hmm. You can do both, and we should do both. We have to, you know, this, these problems are so multifaceted, the hollowing out of our communities through trade deals written over the years, the tax right. laws being rigged and written over the years, our labor laws, our environmental standards, all of it. it, it we need a holistic reform By agenda. By the way, we do that. I didn't mean to say, like, it's just overseas, like, we undercut each other in America. One thing that I, I will give serious credit to the Biden administration, their, their push on antitrust has been incredibly um, heartening to see because one of the things you're talking about is if we're going to let you to have these benefits, and I think one of the biggest benefits that we never talk mm -hmm. about is limited liability. If you set up a corporation, you can take on all this risk, and if that company goes under, you just walk right. away. You just start another company. That's one of the biggest handouts from the public to- It's socialism. It's socialism of losses. They privatize yeah, their that's profits, right. but they socialize their losses. And the justification is we wouldn't have any investment. We wouldn't have any risk taking if we didn't do it. Okay, so we're publicly subsidizing risk in the market because we think that's a good thing. What do we get in exchange? What does the public get back for this? Having that conversation, the quid pro quo, if we're going to bail you out every time there's a crisis, if we're going to give trillions of dollars of, of lending and support services, what are we getting back? Do you think maybe we could get back a slightly cheaper internet rate or something? You know, That's a fantastic point. And here's maybe something, and you guys tell me what you think of this. Why don't we subsidize risk for people? You know, one of the things that makes it so difficult for people to get out of their situation is childcare, healthcare. Uh, you don't wanna leave your job because you're not gonna get healthcare. We make it impossible for people to take risks because they're treading water to just stay afloat. Yet for corporations, we say, if we don't backstop you, you'll never take a risk. So why don't we do that? For people, why don't we view people as human capital to be invested in in that same way? This is what basically FDR wanted in the second bill of economic rights to provide certain protections, safeguards for all Americans. So health care, you mentioned housing, education, the right to a secure retirement, the right to a job with a good you know, wage attached to it. These were the things that FDR fought for and the Democratic Party for many years fought for mm -hmm. as part of the party platform, you know, basic protection, safeguards, rights, economic and economic bill of rights. And it, it, you know, the party just sort of at some point stopped fighting for those things. 
I mean, to give one example, my wife is a second grade teacher. Mm. She had to get a master's degree to even be qualified because we want good quality people looking after our kids. That that master's degree at a public university in New York ended up causing uh, incurring about fifty thousand dollars worth of debt. Now, there's no way in hell she's going to pay that right. back relative to the interest rate. And right now, scholars like Luke Heron have shown that the Biden administration could cancel tens of thousands of dollars of student debt, all of it if they wanted, with the stroke of a pen. They cannot blame Republicans for that. They cannot blame congressional intransigence for that. That is purely an ideological commitment to the idea that higher education, and not just sort of studying the classics under a tree, you know, pondering philosophy and Plato, but getting the skills you need to be a, a nurse, right. a doctor, an engineer. To do those things, you have to become a debt slave for the rest of your life. And we could change that tomorrow, and they just don't want to. So this is the flip side of easy money. Educational institutions understand that. They always tell you this. If you don't get a bachelor's degree, man, your life is over. Now, they don't mention that. A high school, a white high school graduate has more wealth than a black college graduate. That, that's a whole separate conversation. But basically, a bachelor's degree is the ante. And that's going to be 100,000, 200,000. That's your ante to get into the world. And is it, and we've seen an astronomical, talk about inflation. The inflation in education is that a fu is that the danger of easy money? Because they know people have nowhere else to go and they know they're going to do whatever they've got to do to get there. And they know they're going to have customers who will desperately take out loans and they can inflate their administrative costs and they can inflate everything else and they can have an endowment of $3 billion dollars and still be inflating their their year to year costs. Oh, well, you're right. I mean, the credentialization of everything, and it's not just the bachelor's degree. They really get you with you need the extra letters behind your name beyond the bachelor's mm -hmm. uh, degree. Masters so, is the new bachelor's yeah, degree. Yeah, right? and then they make it very very easy to borrow tens of thousands of dollars to to get those degrees. But they what they don't do is really anything to ensure that there's a there's a job with an income that's going to be high enough to allow you to ultimately get out from under that debt on the other side. So what's the foundation of what you guys would, would recommend is the reset? If, if you're recommending a reset, and, and what are the tent posts of that in terms of what that would look like when you think about monetary policy and uh, congressional appropriations and and you know, corporate policy. What's, how, how does that work? I think when it, when it comes to higher education, I think this goes to the same point we were talking about with the COVID crisis, which is, do we want a system where you have to go into debt servitude to be able to get a higher education degree to do, you know, the basic services we think are necessary, like nursing and education? If not, then at the very least, we need to commit to making that free and cancel existing debt, say this was a huge mistake, we went the wrong direction, we want to turn the right. page, but the next day or even the same day, we need to reform the way that we are financing higher education. When people joke that Harvard University is a hedge fund with a university attached for nonprofit status, right? We need to think about that process. There are ways to provide, you know, cheaper goods for everybody that require us to take a bit more active intervention in how those markets and industries are structured. Modern monetary uh, policy is, is maybe an effective tool or a, a new way of looking at things, what's the reset for how corrupt the system currently is? And, and what are some of the tent posts of what it would look like otherwise? I, I don't think either one of you is just saying, yeah, we can just print money and use it for whatever we want, but it's a reprioritizing and it is seemingly uh, being more agile and less doctrinaire in how we use monetary policy and legislative agenda? Well, I mean, most of the focus is on fiscal policy. So it's on what we can do legislatively through Congress. And I think what we did and what we have seen Congress accomplish over the course of the last 20 months or so is just astonishing, right? That you can, with the stroke of a pen, one provision in a single piece of legislation, the child tax credit, that one provision lifted more than 40 percent of all the kids living in poverty out Which of poverty. Which is why we had to end it, Stephanie. We had to end it. We had, we had to stop it. You know, so John, it's like we have 
everywhere you look in the economy, you will find deficits that matter. You will find them in education. You will find them in infrastructure. You will find them in housing. You will find them in child poverty and senior, you know, ability to retire with dignity and all the rest of it and on and on. And you're quite right that you can't solve every problem with a piece of legislation. But the budget is a way to express our values as a nation. It is a way to prioritize, and it is a way to begin to fund some of the longstanding underfunded and address deficiencies in our economy. So we have to figure out what our priorities are. I would go back to that Economic Bill of Rights that I referred to earlier, I think is a very good blueprint and a very solid place to start. Start with the jobs, start with a job with a good pay, with health care and a right to housing and an education. And you're saying deficit spending is the way to address this, that people, that deficit spending won't, it's not a necessity that that drives inflation and it's not a necessity that it saddles future generations with with debt. It's not a necessity that it saddles future generations. It is not the case that deficits are inherently inflationary, but it is true that deficits can get too big. And one possible way for that to materialize is in the form of inflation. So again, you can't spend willy-nilly. You can't drive trillions and trillions too rapidly into a very narrow hole. You have to figure out over what period of time can I safely make these investments in infrastructure. And you have to be able to resource what it is you're trying to do. Rowan said it earlier, if you want to do infrastructure, you have to be sure that you have available to you the co- the contractors, the engineers, the architects, the steel, the machinery. But that you can get ahead of. That's the kind of thing that planning. Oh, oh, John. <laughs> what? You should said I leave? P- I'm just going to go. <laughs> yeah. I should leave. You said, you said the P word. Yeah, you're not getting invited back to the Christmas party now. I apologize. <laughs> This is the scary word because you just said planning. You have to plan. Yes, you have to plan for prosperity. And by the way, boardrooms are invented for the purpose of planning. That's what corporate America does. They go walk into the boardroom for the purpose of planning. So we have to be willing to plan for prosperity. We have to be willing to do that. Let let me ask you a question, though, about what you said about legislative priorities. Because there's a part of me that feels that democracy and especially our system is analog in a new digital world and it's not agile. And we did in the middle of a crisis, do what we can. But as far as the the structure of capitalism and the government moving forward, it doesn't seem particularly suited to addressing the public's needs. It seems more suited to status quo and keeping those that are winning, winning more and keeping those that are losing entrenched. Can we also use the power of monetary policy for those kinds of, uh, those kinds of effects that can help bridge that gap? This is where I think your conversation with Tom to sort of go back to the beginning was so helpful because until we clear about what's actually going on and until the people who know how this works can be honest with someone like you asking very authentic questions, we are not going to have those changes. So for example, let's make all fiscal spending, deficit spending, financed by new money creation. The trillion dollar coin idea that you sort of laughed at 10 years ago, now you've come around. Let's have that be the basis of all fiscal spending. If If the Federal Reserve wants to tighten financial conditions or manage inflation, let's make sure it has the right tools to do that. Let's combine with other agencies like the antitrust divisions, like the planning divisions to make sure we don't hit those inflationary barriers. And let's simplify a lot of this stuff to the level we can have conversations with the public so that it's not something that the monkeys feel so dumb they can't have an opinion on. But don't you think it's purposefully complex and purposefully obtuse? They don't want transparency in any way. And those central those central bankers, they're trained in the art of very careful language. You make a central bank announcement, yeah. all the markets pour over each word like it's a hermeneutic religious right. text. So demystifying that through things like media, through things like this podcast is so important because otherwise there's not we're in the we're in the Catholic Church speaking Latin. Right. We're in that phase of economic theory. Although they were very good with fiscal policy, I have to admit, in terms and of And they had great oh, music. You gotta give tremendous. it tremendous. How does what you're saying differ from sort of more standard Keynesian economics? Or is it different? It's different, John. I think it's different almost from beginning to end. It really is. 
Um, we we are not talking about occasionally priming the pump to get the economy back and running and then turning everything back over to the central bank, which is really what mainstream economics is about. You turn to fiscal to fiscal policy in a moment of crisis. It's like on the wall with the glass, yes. the thing in front of it that says break glass in case of emergency. Right. Otherwise, you do. You got to You got to yeah. land the plane. That's what they always said. Got to land the plane. Yeah, you do not touch fiscal policy. You leave macro policy making up to the technocrats at the central bank, and you sit back and you hope that by dialing the interest rate up and down, you will somehow end up with a, an economy that produces opportunity and good wages and so forth for everybody else, you know, the kinds of educational opportunities, and it won't work. It won't work. But that is mainstream Keynesian economics. Turn the dial, mostly the interest rate dial, use fiscal policy for an emergency, put it back in the box, work to bring down the deficit. So we are we are saying something completely different. And when it comes to jobs, for example, the mainstream central bankers theory for decades now has been that there's a level of unemployment that we have to tolerate. It's sort of like saying, well, I've got a class and two out of 20 of my kids, I'll never teach them. You know, they're un unteachable. Let's just give up on them. They call it the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. It was literally a way of saying, if we push unemployment below this level, it's going to cause inflation. So we're comfortable with calling 5% unemployment full employment. They just, they just threw that 5% away and they said, oh, that's as good as we can get. So that is full employment. Why is it on the consumer level that w when you stimulate that a little bit, it creates this inflationary pressure, but when you stimulate it at the corporate level, there is no pressure. It, it just makes sense then that they're just hoarding it. The assumption there is that if the workers have more jobs, then they'll be able to tell their boss to go fuck themselves and I demand a higher wage. And if they do that, then wages will translate into higher prices in, in consumer goods because companies will take that higher wage cost and put it straight into prices. Let's not talk about their profit share, which is often many multiples of their labor cost. They'll just translate it. So, so that's the thing. What's the lever you could use? So to me, that's the only driver right? If people mm -hmm. start doing better, companies get used to, it's like when they say, let's drop the corporate tax rate. Well, now that's the new high tax rate they've become accustomed to. So unless you drop it to, I mean, I, you almost foresee a point where they're like, look, we'll pay you to stay here. Don't worry about tax. We'll pay you. It's extortion. So how do you get a, a company? If a Walmart says, okay, uh, I'm going to pay these guys more, but the only way I can make it up is I, I've got to jack prices up. Why is that billion dollar profit not in any way, uh, that, that's just, that's the standard. What are the levers that can deal with that? We could regulate prices directly. Right now, the Bank of England's governor, the Central Bank of England, has literally said that workers should try to ask for less wages to keep inflation down. So they're comfortable regulating the price of labor. They're saying the price of labor is too high, we should keep it low. But they will not regulate the profit margins of businesses directly. So that's one thing we could do. We could just say there's a there's a level of profits beyond which we don't want to allow if it translates to higher prices. It's been done historically, excess profit taxes and so forth. They do a luxury tax in baseball. You pay too yeah. much money on the thing, there's a luxury tax. If you make too much profit, yeah. there should be a luxury tax. They have a handicap in golf, you know? <laughs> You know, in Japan, the, the culture is very different, obviously, but they do. There's a practice that's that's pretty effective and well known, and it's called jawboning. And the, the government can quite literally just sort of say something that is, in a sense, shaming companies for you know even thinking about raising prices. They just go, you don't want to do that. We're watching you. That that depends on a culture that can be shamed. I, I yes. I'm not so sure exactly. we have that. Uh, well, we do have the yeah. full muscle of the American federal government in the event that shame doesn't work. that's my work, point. So. How the heck could they do yeah. $120 billion bond buys every month? How could they do quantitative easing? How could they do TARP and not have stipulations we allow it. about... Because we allow it. Yeah. We, we, get, we get the democracy we deserve, that kind of thing. But Lena Khan at the FTC, for example, is trying to start do this. So I think connecting what we're talking about at the macroeconomic monetary level with that direct that's, price market, that's the that's the sweet spot. That micro antitrust with the macro full employment, you know, public goods. That's the, the vision. For and the using future. monetary policy as well as legislative impact, I think is that that was the part that I was trying to get to. We've got this giant weapon. And we only use it in one direction for, for because 
we feel like politically, if the stock market goes down, it's devastating. And B, that they'll just leave. That the, oh, the, the corporations will just leave if we don't, if we're not nicer to them. It's bonkers. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, is there anything else that you felt like I really wanted to make sure that I got through to this person uh, it, it, from his conversation with uh, Thomas Honig or about kind of the, the the policies that we're talking about? I think your initial instincts were good. We can have nice things. And this idea that we can you know print money for the billionaires and for the banks and not for the people is bad. It's not a coherent idea. And anyone that tells you so is gaslighting you. The central bankers get very worried. And, you know, when 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 the bailouts happened after the financial crisis and it became so clear to everyone that the central bank did have a money cannon and that it could just unleash. And, you know, it was trillions right. of dollars in in those years. And people started to scratch their heads and say exactly what you said. Why for them? Why do you aim the cannon only there? And you started to hear people across Europe and elsewhere say, what about a people's quantitative easing? What about QE for the people? And that's what really rattles the central banks right. because people are starting to say it about the European Central Bank. There are proposals to say, listen, we got a climate crisis. We have to have something like a Green New Deal. Where are we going to get the trillions that that's going to require? And they go, wait a minute. I remember Mario Draghi, when he was the head of the ECB, said that we can never run out of money. I remember hearing him say that. <laughs> Neil Kashkari at the Minneapolis Fed Oops. last year said, we have an unlimited amount of dollars at the Fed. And I said, when do you hear the word unlimited coming from a central banker, except to bail out the banking system? When Bernanke said, you can find this video yeah. online too, when Bernanke said, it's, it's not taxpayer money. We just use the computer to mark up the size of the account. And people went, you use the computer. Well, would you use the computer to mark up the size of my account? Oh, my Lord. And that's when people like Jerome Powell have to remind us that the Fed does not have the authority to do that, that, that they could be given the authority, but at present they don't. The marking up of your account can happen when Congress provides the instructions to the Fed. We're sending out checks. Now go help us mark up these accounts. And that's how it happens. And these are the guys who are like, crypto sounds like magic. You know, meanwhile, they're yeah. just like, presto change trillion dollars. Larry Summers is on the board of a number of crypto and fintech firms, but then he has got, you know, nothing but contempt for sending out $600 checks. Yeah, to it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's bonkers. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and, and engaging with the conversation. Thank you for having us. Thank you, John.